May told me, make a fist, then squeeze this bowl as she rubbed alcohol on my arm. When I was a child, I loved this part before I had a blood test. I imagined that the alcohol wipe made the needle less painful. The needle dug into the large vein in my right arm. Then May proceeded to take 18 vials of blood for the research study. After fasting for 16 hours, I was starving. So by the time she was finished, I could identify with a vampire starving for blood. May consoled me, just one more tube and we'll be done. I'll bring you tomato juice. Hmm, like drinking blood. Had I been infected at Niagara Falls, my lover Scott had stubbed his toe and I had bandaged the wound to stem the blood. So here I was at UCLA Men's Study getting tested for HIV because I found out that Scott had cheated on me. I had been part of this study since 1984. This research study was monitoring the progression of male HIV status. When I saw Scott at the hospital last night, just diagnosed with AIDS, he told me, you need to find out if you're infected. We didn't completely practice safe sex, but since we did not have anal intercourse with each other, I blindly assumed that I was safe. I called the men's study. I need to find out if I'm positive. Can you get me an appointment? After the blood test, <clears throat> May, the nurse, started scanning my body for lymph nodes around my neck and my armpit. She spread my fingers and toes to ensure that I didn't have any hidden Carposi sarcoma lesions. My blood pressure was pouring into my earlobes. Did you find anything? Looks good. Your lymph nodes are a little swollen, but that could be normal for you. Next stop, they wanted a semen sample. Please ejaculate into this small plastic container. There is a book in the restroom of nude guys to help you masturbate. Hmm. I would wonder, how was I going to aim into this thing? I, I, I didn't use gay pornographic pictures to masturbate, so I'd have to improvise. I know, too much information. <laughs> On my next visit, I was told that they discontinued this portion of the study because the janitors complained about the cleanup. <laughs> I started an interview about any health changes since my last visit six months ago. Did anyone tell you that you were diagnosed as being HIV positive? No. Do you have night sweats? No. Have you lost weight? I felt like I was a broken record with my constant negative answers. What drugs have you been taking? What? What makes you think I take drugs? Antibiotics don't count, right? Thankfully, I made the interviewer laugh. During the next, during the last six months, did you put your penis in someone else's mouth? Yes, my lover Scott. I stopped answering and just shook my head after I was asked, did anyone put their penis in your mouth? Did you have anal intercourse? I was mentally and physically exhausted from the interrogation. I asked, so how long before I get the results? Well, we can mail them to you within a week. I gulped. An entire week of waiting? My pulse zoomed. Please, God, let me be negative. I slogged through the next seven days. The looming mail delivery was weighing me down. When I woke up each morning, I checked my skin. W was that a mole, a growth, a, a sore? Why was I listless? I'd have a fever. I sensed a mailman outside. He pushed letters and magazines through the mail slot. My breath stilled when I saw the envelope with the men's study return address. 
It felt like the house had become as quiet as a tomb. I wanted to open the letter right away. I remained paralyzed. I, I should be sitting down on my couch so I don't faint. Once my foot stopped bouncing, I used a slip, slick letter opener to rip open my fate. The words, your HIV status has not changed, stared at me from the page. What? <laughs> what does that mean? I, I don't know what my status was because we had been forbidden to ask. Anger was taking hold. I waited a week for that. I saw a phone number of questions. Hi, I, I, got, I just got this letter from my test and it doesn't tell me anything. Oh, we didn't want to have anything in writing that the insurance company could use to deny you coverage. Can you give me your ID number? Yeah, it's 149697. Yes. I see this is your fourth visit. You've been testing HIV negative. No change. My mouth swallowed a whirl of oxygen. I memorized this moment of sobbing. I immediately called Scott and told him the news as tears of relief seeped through the phone. I imagined this crying was cathartic. I had wiped away any guilt that he might have had had I tested positive. And maybe because I was faithful to Scott for our years together from age 21 to 36 and 1973 to 1989, I never had a chance to get infected. I remained negative and, and because I wouldn't have anal sex with Scott, this had caused him to stray. Was I partially responsible for Scott getting AIDS? I didn't want to answer questions like this. If I did, it would make my blood curdle. But within a year, the answers crystallized in this conversation I had with Scott. I started, really? I don't see why you cheated. This is bullshit. I can't believe it. When we saw movies and there was infidelity, you complained. You went ahead and had sex with strangers? You're a hypocrite. And to think about those vows you made when we got married in 1974. Scott answered, well, my parents never acknowledged the relationship, so I thought I didn't need to follow the norms of marriage. I'm surprised you aren't telling me <clears throat> that it was because the marriage wasn't legal, and that's why you fucked hitchhikers. I can't believe you would use your parents as an excuse to screw around. I thought you were a smart PhD. I wanted to be a top during anal sex, and you wouldn't let me. Well, if you had anal warts burned off, you wouldn't do it either. You're blaming me? How did you get AIDS if you were the top? Well, the guys ended up doing it to me. I'm sorry I screwed up. I thought we had a good sex life. I wanted to feel sexy. When I was with these guys, they made me feel young. It was exciting. I, I was wounded by his honesty. This blonde and blue-eyed man who I met and fell in love with had ripped my heart. Gordon, you would lie around in your underwear when we watch television together. You wouldn't shave on the weekend. How would you expect me to get turned on when we had sex? You never told me that. And my father was the same way. I never heard my mother complain. This must be a Jewish thing. <laughs> he laughed. I was traumatized by, by him sharing this stuff with me. Gordon, I love you. I didn't want to harm us. I, I need this intimacy with you. The rest of this crap doesn't matter. A month later, before Scott died, he was sitting on the same couch where I had learned of my negative status. The morning sun was behind him. His gaunt cheeks accentuated his blue eyes. We had a lingering, wordless scare. Gordon, I, I think I wet myself. I said, oh no, get up and let me clean it up. It's going to ruin the chair. Oh shit, 
You can buy a new chair after I'm gone. I stopped, kissed him, and tucked away the shame of my selfish, controlling personality. I told Scott, I'm thinking that if you were in a hospice, you would get better care. I wouldn't worry about you when I'm at work. We didn't have a wheelchair. My friends took Scott's twin legs out of bed and gently placed him on his desk chair. It was like a Jewish wedding where the bride and groom are carried by the wedding party in chairs up in the air. When we arrived at the Chris Brownlee Hospice, the serenity was in such contrast to the zombie-like shuffling patients. It didn't take courage for me to say I love you when I left the hospice. Abandoning Scott shamed me. Selfish, empty thoughts smacked me when I returned home because I had never taken a leave of absence from work to care for him. And I had listened to my therapist who asked me, are you okay with Scott dying in your condo? And I said, no. Besides my daily visit, only my friend Paul had the strength to see Scott. Paul revealed, I had written a poem and read it to Scott. He was going blind. I think he was protecting you. He didn't want you to worry. I didn't realize I needed to be shielded. 10 days later, I received a call at work. Scott passed early this morning. His heart stopped. When I arrived at the hospice, Scott was lying peacefully in his room with cotton pads covering his eyes. I stared at his life, listless form. I couldn't cry. Iced numbness took me o over until the lyrics of Touch Me in the Morning took me back 16 years to when I met Scott and we made it our song. Leave me as you found me, empty like before. I had lost my lover of 16 years. I was 36, the same age that my mom was when she became a widow in 1965. Despite my relief that I wasn't infected, there was a part of me that struggled to forgive Scott and myself. I needed to believe that I did the best I could dealing with Scott's betrayal. Months later, when I was going through Scott's journals, I found a bittersweet comment about not wanting to live beyond 40. He died on March 2nd. 1989, at the age of 39, four months shy of his birthday. We weren't blood related, but blood connected us, interweaving our veins together, fluid memories of our life blood. Gordon Blitz.